Once upon a time, no trip to the seaside was complete without a ride on Raja the Elephant. Powered by a petrol engine, it had the ability to carry up to six people at a time. In the late 1940s, it was often seen ferrying children up and down the Morecambe Promenade. My name's Eric Smith. I've lived in Morecambe all my life, apart from one or two breaks. National Service in Scotland. And I used to have a little train running on the beach when I came out of the National Service at Redcar. So, um, Eric, where exactly does your story begin? My business life started when I was about eight years old. I used to work on the Winter Gardens Fairground for a man called One Arm Jack. That's because he only had one arm. <clears throat> My father became self-employed after the war and he opened a motor repair shop. But I left school at that point and he decided he'd buy a little roundabout to run on the Winter Gardens Fairground because of my experience on the fairground as a kid. And then I could, he said to the mother he can sweep the garage and brew tea in the winter. He didn't have much uh, hope for me, I don't think. <laughs> anyway, um, I, ran, I operated the, uh, for a couple of years. So I, I said to Dad, I'm going to stop in the garage winter and summer. Mm -hmm. uh, so, all right, he got rid of the roundabout. But he still had an interest in amusements, children's amusements. And he went off for a day trip with Mother to Bellevue is an amusement park near Manchester and he had seen an elephant a real live one giving rides well his mind got working and when he got back he said to me I'm going to build a mechanical elephant well I said to him well I'm not interested in that kind of thing I'm a motor mechanic now I work in the garage Father and a neighbour, at weekends, they knocked up this first mechanical elephant. Well, I didn't like the look of it. And I thought, I could make it look a little bit better than that. So when they started on the second one, I got involved. I made this landing stage, and they even end up in, ended up on the beach operating the elephant and I always remember I was only 16 at that time not quite 17 uh, the local policeman who was a customer of ours a police inspector at Morecambe he said to dad your Eric shouldn't be taking that elephant on the road without a license so I had to stop taking it out on the road till I was trying to pass my test <laughs> well it had seashells as toes uh, wipe a motor in the head, which flicked the ears and, and moved the eyes. And we had a customer, a, a dental surgeon, and he, he volunteered to make some eyes for, for our elephants. It had an Austin 7 engine and a, and a cut down Austin 7 back axle at the back with sprockets on and chains down to the wheels and it was covered in barrage balloon barrage balloon fabric which was surplus after the war painted it with bostic and then painted it grey now my dad's dad was offered he, he patented it and he was offered Five thousand pound for the patent, which was a lot of money then. It's like about hundred thousand now. So, um, what made you transition from building mechanical elephants to trains on tracks, and then to trackless trains? Having sold the patent, we then Dad bought a little steam train, seven and a quarter inch gauge. He had a little track 
short length of track in the garage and he used to get up steam and run it up and down. But we got a side to Esham Head. Now there's a lot involved in getting up steam and that sort of thing. He decided we would build a dummy dining car and put an Austin 7 engine in it. And this pushed it up and down the track. Dad had a trip down to Brighton and he saw some miniature buses. And he bought two of these and we run those at Eshamed. I, I wasn't... In later life, I thought I could do a better thing. They only carried four children. You lifted two in the front and two in the back. That wasn't so good for me. So actually when I came out of the rough, I finally got round to my idea of a miniature bus. Carried 12 children. They went in the doorway, walked down the aisle and sat either side. Now I never got round to running that. A man that we used to deal with a lot in St Albans came up and he bought it off me. And then a couple of weeks later I get a phone call from London. This Canadian chap was over in England looking for amusement rides. And I said, well, I'm not building any more this year because I've got to get ready to go a red car. I run one on the beach each summer. I'm coming up to see you, he said. He put the phone down. When he came to see me, I said, this is what you've just missed. And I showed him a photograph of this minute. It's your boss. The following week, I get a letter saying, your miniature bus is on its way to Canada. <laughs> Dad, Dad also, he bought a, a steam train, train chassis and he wanted me to build a cab and boiler. Well, I said to Dad, I'll tell you what I'll do, I'll make it like a Coronation Scot, streamlined and matching coaches, silver line all the way down. So we run that at Happy Mount Park. We also run a little motor car with an engine in, pulling four Honda motorbikes. They were like a miniature motorbike. But they do a proper motorbike, but a miniature. Mm -hmm. And we also run some of those behind the, the middle of the hotel. Now, Dad decided with a train at Happy Mount, train at Ishamed, we ought to have one on the beach. So he gets this, he builds a chassis with the big driving wheels and the little bogey at the front, and he takes it out to test drive it, and it wouldn't steer. So I said, I'll tell you what, we'll make it like an American diesel electric. That could be because when I came out of the RAF, Instead of knocking things together with all second hand bits, I decided I was going to produce these trackless trains as brand new. I, I, I think I made about three that first year. One I saw a year or two back running at uh, the Duke of Bedford's estate, mm -hmm. still running a couple of years back. It was a happy a very interesting period in my life from being 16 up to about 24.